My name is Dr. Steve Van Vliet. I'm the Regional Extension Specialist for Washington State University in Ag and Natural Resources. And I'm Rebecca McGee. I work for USDA ARS. I'm a plant geneticist, which means I'm a plant breeder, and I work at WSU in Pullman, Washington. So it's nice to be here with Rebecca today because we are we work collaboratively all the time on these different types of projects. Here you're standing in the middle of a we're in the middle of a spring variety testing plot. Um, behind you, which you can't see at this time, but is our is our winter. And in this year it's about the same size. What's the advantage of having these? Well, is because we have different varieties or different lines that are that are planted at different times of the year. And I'll get into that here in just a little bit. Where do I receive these lines? I actually receive these lines from different seed companies and also receive the lines from USDA RS, which are going to contain their genetic material. So every year Steve sends out a letter asking for entries in the trials. And I send him entries based on how they've done in my trials in the previous years. So this year, for instance, I sent him 10 spring breeding lines and about six advanced winter breeding lines. Um, I make the selections uh, based on how they do throughout the Palouse region of Washington and Idaho, um, as well as how they do in some of the disease nurseries they get sent to. So the lines that, that I enter into Steve's trials, as well as other breeders enter into his trials, they're pretty much the best that we have. Uh, we, we test typically several hundred different varieties or breeding lines every year and we send our top one or ten percent to Steve for evaluation. Um, it's really useful for us to have this because it allows us then to see how our varieties and breeding lines perform relative to other breeders and other companies in environments that we're not necessarily able to test in. So it's really complementary to my breeding program and really gives me a lot more information than I would have if I had to do it all myself. Really a very important part about this and doing these studies is really the collaborators, we, the collaborators we work with and the growers that donate their land for us to be able to do this. Without cost, I'm probably taking up in a lot of, a lot of times with my studies up to three acres. You know, so that is really, it takes some profit away from that landowner, but they also get vital information for growing spring and winter peas in these production zones. And this production zone in Walla Walla is very, very good for our legumes. No, they don't grow many lentils. Maybe they should. Lentils do very well down here. But also, chick, they do grow quite a few chickpeas, and they grow winter peas and spring peas. And they do very, very well. I have approximately... Um, 29 winter peas out here and I have around 37, no, this year I think I have about almost 50 lines of spring peas and then it goes into about 10 lines of lentils and another t um, 15 lines of chickpeas, something like that. So like I say, the, the grower's land that we use the cooperators that we are able to work with is the only way to make this a successful program. When we talk winter peas, I'll just talk about winter peas just a tiny bit. And um, winter peas, the wonderful thing about that is they're really, they will yield three times the amount of what spring peas do. Another important thing is they're growing throughout the, the cold temperatures and they're blooming a lot earlier. So in the spring, they'll bloom much earlier than such as a spring pea. And those spring pea lines, you know, even though they're yielding less, the winter pea lines will avoid the hot temperatures. And this year, obviously, we've got very, very hot temperatures. Typically, the, even these spring pea lines, the height of them would be almost up to my hip. In the winter pea lines, they're a lot higher than that. And like I say, much higher yield. So that's the advantage of them. With all of them, when you see, it comes to seeding, you wanna seed these lines into moisture. So whether you're going in the fall, whether you're going in the spring, you wanna get them down into moisture. 
Another advantage is they're actually much stronger than a lot of our other crops. When it comes to emergence, they can emerge through crusts, they can emerge through soils that are very, very difficult. And we can't say the same for even when we look at our grains, which a lot of this country is covered with grains, but they emerge better than our grains. And they can canopy over the rows, when I'm talking winters, canopy much earlier in the spring, so weed control is much lower. The inputs on weed control are gonna be lower. You have it flowering earlier, so you're gonna get them forming pods earlier and your yield is gonna be much higher. Do you have anything to say on the? And side? one of the reasons also why the winter peas yield so much more than the spring peas is that they tend to tiller. Uh, spring peas, if we get one or two tillers, it's pretty good for a spring pea. But winter peas, we can get six, eight, ten tillers. Um, typically, in a spring pea, we might get um, 10 pods per plant, 12 pods per plant. In the winter peas, we typically get at least 50 pods. So that, that's where the yield difference comes in. Thank you. And also, so I talked about the seeding depth. Another thing to keep in mind, and not only for when it comes to the pulse production side of things, when it comes to winter wheat or any of these other things, is the soil pH and what are the soil conditions when you're planting in. This grower is very progressive and you can see a lot of vegetation still on the ground, a lot of cover, which keeps the soils cooler, keeps the moisture here. So this is a very, very good production zone for that. And we have a lot of variable ground all throughout the Palouse, which is another high production zone for our legumes but we have these different areas. So you need to pay attention. What, what's the pH there? What kind of disease pressure do you have in these areas? So that you can try to avoid that. So when it comes to winter pea production in some of our areas where it's worked the best is because we can transition it into our much drier zones. Our spring peas, yes, and our winter peas both fit in this Walla Walla production zone. But if we're say out at Lind or Ritzville or Davenport or Wilbur, those types of areas have not seen anything except typically a winter wheat production and then going into a fallow system. This is a very good opportunity to use winter peas in those production systems to get not only a high value crop through those years that you're not growing anything, but um, a crop other than just going with the small grains. Yeah, it'll provide the growers in the dry areas a, a true rotational crop, we think. Also, when you're seeding any of the peas, I talked about seeding it into moisture, really the depth that you want to get this in is really going to be critical at least two and a half inches. Three inches, I like to seed all my peas at three inches in depth. You could go a little bit less with some lentils and chickpeas, but I, I wouldn't suggest it, but as long as you're seeding into moisture, that's a very, very good thing. Then they can get up, get going, canopy over, and, and compete with the weeds. We can even see in some of these areas on our spring peas that are in front of, in front of us that they're quite competitive. I mean, we will have, between rows, we'll get some weeds, but within the plots themselves, they're very, very competitive and they're forming a lot of these different pods. And we can see the pods here, they're starting to fill. So now in Walla Walla, we've been able to avoid these hot temperatures, especially the temperatures that are coming up. When it's over 90 degrees with our legumes, if they're blooming, we will have them drop their blooms and pretty much abortion of that, of that seed. So we have to that's the, an advantage with the winters in typical years. This, nothing's typical, but in this year, under typical situations, we have the pods filling, the pods already potted at this point in time in the winters, and the springs are just starting to do that. They're just finishing up flowering, to be honest, at this period of time in typical years. This year, everything is going to be much shorter, and that's going to be the same with any of the crops we're harvesting. Yeah, this year is one of those years that's um, hopefully an anomaly. Uh, we don't, 
peas and pea breeders don't like hot weather. Like Steve said, above, above 90 degrees or 30 C, um, the pollen aborts, the flowers fall off, um, it'll knock them out of bloom. So Steve looks at it and he says, disaster. I look at it as the plant breeder, always optimistic and say, excellent opportunity to select for heat tolerance and drought tolerance. And boy, this is the year to do it. That is, that, that's for sure. Some of the characteristics that we want to evaluate are some, some are very similar to a breeder that they want to evaluate. They want to look at what, what the diseases are on here, if they're resistant or not. I don't really look at the resistant side of things, but I'll look at disease pressure. So if some are exhibiting pressure from a phantomyces or fusarium or something like that, I can at least notice that. And then I'll have the experts in that field, such as the legume breeder, Rebecca comes out and says, yes, this is a phantomyces, this is fusarium. This one's resistant typically to that. How are they reacting to the disease pressure? Not only that, how well is it competing when it comes to weed control? So it's not always yield. We definitely look at yield, yes. And we want to look at standability also. You know, how well do they stand up? Because when we're harvesting these, we don't want something like the old standard for winter pea production used to be Austrian winter peas. Well, it's really a feed pea and they lay very much on the ground. Well, we, we want to collect as little dirt as we possible. So we want to have something that stands, also produces a lot of yield, and it's disease tolerant if we can find that. And we have. <clears throat> so that's a good segue into some of the winter pea breeding work that we've done in the past uh, decade or so. Um, in 2009, we started breeding winter peas that were not Austrian winter peas, that were uh, food quality peas. And this year, well, last year at the, the uh, field day, we were in the winter pea trials and we talked about some of the ones that are looking good, we're going to release them. Well, this spring um, they were released. We've released uh, three new winter peas that are all three food quality. Their names are Mica, uh, Dint, and Klondike. Uh, Mica and Dint are both green. Uh, Klondike is yellow. Uh, they all have large seeds, about um, 18 to 23 grams per hundred seeds, which is as large or larger than the typical spring pea. And like Steve said earlier, the yields are two to three times what the uh, spring peas are. So over the past um, four years, the average yield of Klondike was almost 6,200 kilograms per hectare. The yield for mica was a little over 5,800 kilograms per hectare. And for dint, um, almost 5,000 kilograms per hectare. A typical spring pea in this area would probably yield two and a half to three and a half thousand kgs per hectare. So this is a significant yield increase. Um, they all have good levels of tolerance to fusarium wilt race one. Klondike is resistant to powdery mildew and the, the we're still not sure of the disease status of dint for resistance to peonation mosaic virus. Um, it might be resistant, we're not quite sure yet. So these lines are all being grown now for seed increase by Washington State Crop Improvement Association. Uh, they very fortunately decided this year to grow them in the basin under irrigation, the right year for doing that. Um, I'm not sure when seed for production will be available, but I would estimate in the next uh, year to two years. And we have some wonderful, like Rebecca just mentioned, we have some wonderful lines that are coming along, especially when it comes to food pea production here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, a lot of our winners, of course, what we're testing now is food peas. I mean, that, when it comes to the peas here, in the springs, they've always been tested as a food pea, but now the winters are a food pea, and what comes into account on a food pea is what, Rebecca? 
Well, what we're interested in now, is, as is the whole rest of North America, um, plant-based proteins. And so peas are one of the most desirable plant-based proteins that there are because um, there are very few allergenis allergenistic issues associated with it, uh, and they're non-GMOs. So peas are really becoming a very popular crop all of a sudden for people to do research on. And so in the past few years, we've been spending a lot of time um, evaluating the protein concentration, the protein quality, as well as the uh, mineral nutrients that are um, in the harvested seeds. So right now, to my knowledge, farmers are not being paid a premium for protein. Um, I imagine that will be changing in the very near future. I hope it's changing in the near future. Um, most of our peas have protein from the high teens to mid 20%. Um, and there's a significant amount of genotype by environment interaction. That means that the peas that are grown here in Walla Walla, the same variety is gonna probably have a very different protein concentration from the variety that's grown in Lind or um, near Pullman. So what we're looking for, of course, is a pea that has high protein, but we also want a pea that has stable high protein. So it doesn't matter where I grow it, um, I'm going to have a, a high protein concentration in the harvested crop. And we're actually looking, that's a very good point, because we're actually looking at that also in our chickpeas. You know, when it comes to the chickpea production, I don't want to leave out the other legumes because they're very, very important here in the testing program and also within the breeding programs. And a lot of those, they're starting to look at more of the proteins in that, you know, not, not just going into say like five bean salads and four, those kind of things, but really going into a fractionated market with, with higher proteins in those. Another thing that's coming along the pike and it's coming um, out of Rebecca's program are winter lentils. And I will be testing winter lentils Hopefully she doesn't mind me bringing it up, but I will be testing these winter lentils. Um, I've tested them once before, but I'll be testing them this coming fall also. And I, I know lentils are very cold tolerant. Yep, they are. Um, the, lentil, the winter lentil breeding program that we have is focusing on breeding uh, just a few market classes compared to the spring lentil breeding program. But for the winter lentils, we decided to focus on uh, the small green or Eston type, the, the medium green or Richley types, um, as well as the Pardina or Spanish brown types. Um, just focusing on these three market classes, we thought would really fit what a lot of the lentil growing area is accustomed to and would also be something that we could realistically create. Uh, we've kind of shied away from the large green ones because that large size is kind of difficult to get and we've shied away from the Turkish red types because we just don't grow Turkish reds in the Pacific Northwest. So as just a tiny bit of transition on the end towards the end of this is when it comes to insect pressure or pressure from things. We talked about diseases when it comes to insect pressure on peas what problems are we going to have? We're going to have pea weevil, okay? Pea weevil is going to be standard. What it does is, is it gets in right prior to flowering, it gets in like the clamshell, I think they call it clamshell stage, of the, when the pea is about to flower and they will lay their eggs and then we have a lot of problem. They, they, they are inside the pea themselves, the pea pod themselves, and they'll infest in those pods. So that is a common problem. Sometimes we do get pea leaf weevil early in the season, but that's variable. It varies at different areas. Um, sometimes this area can be a hot spot or Dayton area, but this year we really have seen very limited, it's very limited. It's that there, we've seen it pretty bad in Lewiston where we have some plots, but otherwise it hasn't been that noticeable. And we don't see many insect problems. Aphids. In other than that, except for aphids, especially in peas, peas we'll see aphids and we'll see diseases come from the, those 
when it comes to, um, for sure, lentils. Yeah, peas and lentils both. And on our peas. So. Yeah, so the aphids vector virus diseases. And in this area, um, there are several that are really important. And some years they will absolutely destroy the crop, and in some years you might not even get them. So we've, we've really focused a lot on breeding for resistance to these um, virus diseases because just spraying a, a field with an insecticide, you might kill the aphids, but they've already transmitted the disease. So we're working really hard on developing varieties that have resistance to pea seedborne mosaic virus, to bean leaf roll virus, and to pea nation mosaic virus. Uh, the recently released uh, green pea cultivar Hampton has resistance to um, pea nation and bean leaf roll, but not to uh, pea seedborne. We're really fortunate in being able to screen in the field for resistance to those viruses in Corvallis, Oregon. Every year they host a virus nursery. Um, they plant it late, it's naturally infected. Uh, every single entry that has, uh, that does not have resistance will get at least some of the plants with symptoms of the diseases. So it's a very effective, very simple, very cheap way to screen for multiple diseases at once. And what about um, lentils? Lentils are, are, have the same virus issues that peas do, as well as powdery mildew, as well as soil-borne pathogens. So a lot of these happen, a lot of the times we're getting diseases and insect pressure. This is a perfect year, okay, for that. Not a perfect year for us to see it, but it might be perfect year for breeders to see this type of information. For me, like Rebecca said, oh my gosh, it looks like a disaster in places. But for breeding and for looking at things that are influencing because of all the different stresses, this is an ideal to show that, a year to show that. Because with stresses come on more problems, the diseases attack more, the insects attack more. You have, um, you can find out more that are resistant to drought. All those types of factors are really pronounced this year in all our different crops. So the only thing we didn't mention is maybe some of the problems with chickpeas. Chickpeas really don't have too many problems when it comes to the insect side of things. But our primary disease problem, of course, in chickpeas, and I just wanted to mention this, is, is Ascochyta. Really, is that the problem? We, yes, we do have some, um, we do have some treatments for that, but a lot of times the, the treatment now has become resistance. We have to start looking at that because another stressor that's out here is so, the soil health. The pH of these soils, and like I said, this is an ideal year if you have low pH, acidic soils, that causes a problem with all our legumes that are growing. But all those stressors can bring into play different diseases, insect pressure, and that kind of thing, no matter what the crop is. So I think we, uh, really, today, Rebecca, thank you for being here. Um, it's great that we are able to work together on these different things and, and see it. And uh, hopefully this is good information for you. You can contact us anytime. Yep. We're open anytime for you to contact us and we can talk you through if you've never produced or grown such things as legumes on your property. Thank you. Yep, thank you very much.